Okay, well, uh, a very good afternoon, everybody there in uh, Kazakhstan, a very good morning from here in London, and welcome to this uh, information session, looking a little bit about uh, demystifying uh, machine learning, and also speaking a little bit about the opportunities for you to uh, pursue a graduate diploma at KBTU. So uh, indeed, uh, hello, uh, my name is Dr. James Abdi. I am an associate uh, professor, professorial uh, lecturer uh, in statistics at the London School of Economics and Political Science. So in my day-to-day uh, -day job, I teach uh, various students the joys of uh, statistics. I'm also heavily involved with uh, the University of London's international uh, uh, programs, uh, such that um, in the pre-COVID era, at least, I would travel a lot around the world to our various um, uh, recognized teaching centers, including KBTU, which I've had the um, pleasure of visiting on uh, many occasions. So uh, this session is being uh, recorded, so you'll be able to listen again um, at your leisure. Just a little bit on uh, format for today. So in a moment, I'll begin uh, a short presentation looking a little bit about machine learning. More specifically, what is it? What does it uh, involve? And uh, to give some uh, nice real world examples um, of um, uh, machine learning uh, in practice. Thereafter, I'll speak uh, a bit more about uh, the University of London and uh, the LSE uh, and uh, the links with KBTU with respect to uh, graduate diploma offerings in both uh, data science and also business analytics. And uh, we'll leave some time at the very end uh, if uh, there are any questions uh, from you. Okay, let me just uh, rearrange some things on my uh, screen. And, and we will begin. Okay, let us go for uh, this one. Uh, okay, so I have uh, entitled uh, this talk Rise of the Machines, a, 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 a spin off of one of the Terminator films. So, this is um, a, a brief overview of uh, machine uh, learning. So, uh, what is it all about? Well, um, The Economist uh, a few years ago ran a uh, cover uh, whereby they um, posed a question whether data is or are the new oil. Now note I said is or are, in that is data a singular or plural noun? I think you will often find it um, written in um, uh, either form. I think strictly speaking from the Latin datum would be like a single uh, a data point and data would be uh, the plural. Now, um, I love analogies when I teach. And so I, uh, when I heard about this question, it was, I thought, quite thought provoking. Indeed, should we think of data as uh, the new oil? Because clearly data is at the heart of data science and of course machine learning techniques. So um, while analogies I think are very useful devices, um, often analogies are not perfect. So if perhaps we begin with maybe the imperfection of this analogy in that if we consider the uh, quantity uh, factor of both oil and data, here, the analogy does not really hold up well because oil is finite. Okay, maybe um, new uh, reserves or deposits of oil are periodically uh, discovered through uh, processes of oil exploration around the world. Nonetheless, there is a finite amount of oil under the ground uh, to be extracted. And indeed, perhaps in the years and decades ahead, maybe the world gradually um, shifts to uh, a greener. Uh, economy, but nonetheless, uh, oil itself will be still sought after for uh, the foreseeable future, but it is finite. In contrast, data is effectively infinite. And uh, I love statistics, I love fun facts. And one fun fact is the following. It has been estimated that in the last two or three years, we have collected more data digitally than in the rest of human history combined. Now, uh, while that is an estimate, uh, I think the sort of ballpark um, sense of that estimate is about right. And I find that a staggering statistic, i.e. in the last two or three years, we've probably collected more new data than in the rest of human history combined. 
Now, if you were to extrapolate, so uh, be forward looking, appear into the future, and if we assume that trend continues, then clearly there really is no shortage of data out there. So on the quantity side, oil and data are not really alike. And indeed, because there's so much data out there, there's a huge demand for data scientists, i.e. people who have the uh, requisite skills, the quantitative skills, in order to make sense of that data. So, so far, our analogy or speculation that data is the new oil um, has fallen short. However, I think there is one sense in which the analogy is excellent, uh, i.e. Uh, this sense of refinement. So if you imagine sort of a crude oil, so when you uh, extract it in its raw form from uh, the ground, in its sort of rawest form, the oil has limited use. It's only once the oil has been through an oil refinery and then transformed into something uh, with a real value add. So things like your jet fuel, uh, gasoline, uh, etc. So uh, here is where I think our analogy serves um, uh, very well. Now this pyramid, it's um, a few decades old, but I think the um, uh, principles being conveyed here are as relevant today as when the pyramid was first uh, created. In that, at the bottom of this period, uh, pyramid, we have data. Uh, and think of this like the raw, um, uh, the crude oil okay, in its raw form. And so what uh, data scientists need to do is to basically create some significant value add, really sort of refining the data, uh, extracting the informational value from it. So just as the crude oil will subsequently be uh, converted to jet fuel, uh, et cetera, likewise from the uh, huge sea of raw data out there, we need to refine it using appropriate um, uh, statistical techniques in order to find sort of the message in the data, the information. And information is power, it gives us knowledge, and ultimately will allow us to make decisions and hopefully wise decisions. So really, um, in the fields of data science and business analytics, we are concerned with decision making, but of course, data driven decision making. So is data the new oil? Um, yes and no, uh, but from the refinement perspective, I would say a definite uh, yes. Now let's sort of fast forward a moment and suppose we have collected a you know, huge amount of data and use appropriate techniques to help us solve some particular um, problems of interest and many examples to come. But once this has been uh, completed, we clearly need to tell people, tell the wider world about our discoveries. And I thought I would just um, uh, emphasize here the importance of storytelling to um, a, a good uh, data scientist's or a data analyst's skill set. Now, when I talk about telling stories, I do not mean stories of fiction, uh, I mean stories of fact uh, driven by uh, data. Uh, such that this element of strong communication skills, a vital uh, component to um, a, a data scientist uh, uh, toolkit. And I think uh, the late great Albert Einstein put it very well and indeed very simply, that if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. So while perhaps some machine learning techniques could be very complicated, uh, let's say you have done this um, analysis, you have uh, converted your data into information, knowledge, wisdom, and now you have some um, decisions uh, to make, and you have some recommendations about what those decisions should be. Now, in most uh, organizations, if we consider the private sector, um, uh, perhaps initially, um, most of the time, the people who are doing the data analysis are not the actual key decision makers. And so upon discovery of some exciting trend pattern or relationship uh, from which you feel a particular um, commercial decision should be made, then it is vital that you are able to communicate your findings in easy to understand terms to the key decision makers in the organization many of whom will not be that 
um, uh, mathematically or statistically literate. And so being able to break down very complex ideas into easy to digest uh, formats is an essential, um, an essential uh, tool for a data scientist. So what is a, a modern data scientist? Now, please don't feel uh, that this uh, caricature is uh, being stereotypical of data scientists. Fairly um, you know, white males are not the only possible data scientists. Uh, just, um, I think this one looks a little bit like, uh, like, like me. So um, we can think of uh, these sort of ideal uh, data scientists as having uh, skills in a variety of areas. Uh, taking um, them uh, in order, Top left, uh, maths and statistics and uh, machine learning. We see there uh, mentioned at the uh, as the uh, head headline one. Give some examples uh, in a moment, and perhaps this is um, uh, the default um, expectation about what a data scientist needs to know. Well, it is in part, but by no means is a strong uh, training in mathematics and statistics uh, collectively exhaustive of what um, a modern data scientist uh, needs to know. Uh, clearly with a very large uh, data sets and given the last two to three years, more data collected than in the rest of uh, human uh, history, clearly uh, many of the data sets we have um, in practice are extremely large. And so we need to be able to uh, deal with um, a database management to be able to uh, retrieve uh, the essential data that we need for a particular task and perhaps uh, write um, a computer program using some programming language uh, like Python, like R, a couple of um, very uh, popular programming languages some of you may have heard of, um, in order to um, uh, analyze uh, that large amount of, of data. Uh, then at the bottom end, um, uh, the domain knowledge and soft skills. So depending on the specific sector uh, that you would wish to go and work in, whether it's a private sector, public sector, um, in the private sector, is it sort of finance, pharmaceuticals, retail, um, uh, the non-profit sector as well. Uh, clearly one needs a, a strong understanding of the specific um, challenges uh, that a particular organization in a specific sector uh, um, uh, faces. So this uh, sort of domain knowledge in your particular field would be required in order to think about how to uh, define the sort of research question of interest. Because while there's no shortage of data, uh, there is a shortage of people who can make sense of data, often the most difficult part in um, a sort of data science project is knowing where to start. Namely, what is the question or question questions you are trying to answer, such that if you do not uh, spend sufficient time sort of brainstorming what the problems are that you're trying to um, either diagnose or identify, then you may be wasting a lot of time analyzing data for a, a useless purpose. And this is where I would say the domain knowledge um, and skills are particularly important to allow you to think about what kinds of uh, problems do need to be researched. And last, but by no means least, uh, bottom right there, the importance of communication and visualization. Remember, the means to explain perhaps very complex um, ideas and results in easy to understand terms for the intended audience, let's say the key decision makers in an organization. And there are many, uh, data visualization tools out there. Things like uh, Tableau is one that I use quite uh, frequently. And indeed in some of uh, the modules run uh, with the University of London programs, uh, you would have access to a Tableau in order to uh, gain the experience to create uh, dashboards, effectively create a story of um, uh, visualizations. So really it's a, a mixture of these elements. And just to jump ahead briefly to our uh, respective graduate diplomas uh, in uh, data science and business analytics, broadly speaking, the data science uh, graduate diploma will focus more on these sort of programming, database management aspects, uh, as well as a strong grounding in the mathematics and statistics. Whereas the graduate diploma in business analytics focuses a bit more on the communication and visualization. Uh, the 
um, or, uh, development of commercial acumen that would really fall under the domain knowledge and soft skills, but also some uh, mathematics and statistics as well. Okay, so let's perhaps now focus in on machine learning. What is it? Well, this is inevitably a somewhat concise uh, definition, perhaps doesn't do full justice to what machine learning can achieve, but we have limited time. So uh, machine learning, a set of methods that can automatically detect patterns in data. So uh, while we have vast um, quantities of data, uh, these represent data on many different variables. And of interest to us is to identify patterns, pattern recognition, looking for relationships between variables. And if we can identify them and detect them, we can perhaps then use them for uh, prediction purposes, such that decision making, um, whatever the decision may be, every decision you make, when you make it, it is at the uh, present moment in time. But when you're making decisions, you're being forward looking in what those um, decisions are designed to achieve. So the fact that you are um, tuning in today to this session, uh, some of you may be considering a graduate diploma of ours, either in data science or business analytics. And if so, uh, great, um, I think that's a, um, a great aspiration, um, but perhaps not today, but maybe in the coming days, weeks, months, you will need to make a decision about whether to actually act on that interest and ultimately apply, hopefully gain admission, and then um, register and study uh, one or other of those graduate diplomas. So at the moment you have to make the decision, there's clearly uncertainty about the final outcome, uncertainty about what the your grade would be for that graduate diploma, um, uncertainty about what perhaps your uh, employment prospects will be afterwards. If you are seeking to enter the labor market straight after completion of the graduate diploma, um, clearly today you don't have certainty about what uh, or which specific job you would get, uh, the salary, uh, the employer, um, uh, the sector you'd be working in, uh, whether that's in Kazakhstan or perhaps working um, uh, uh, overseas. So all decisions are made in the present, um, but with a, a future um, uh, or looking into the future for the consequences of those decisions. The future hasn't happened yet. The future is uncertain. So all decisions that we make are made under uncertainty. And therefore, um, if we care about the future, but we don't know exactly what the future holds, then the best we can hope to do is to predict the future uh, with not uh, perfect uh, accuracy, but hopefully as precisely as possible. So machine learning uh, inevitably is related with numerous fields, uh, one of which uh, data mining. And when I like to convey what data mining involves, let's take away data and just look at the word mining. So let's say um, you are a country rich in uh, commodities and natural resources, I know what Kazakhstan is, um, mining. If you have a sort of plot of land, um, let's say you're trying to mine for gold or diamonds or even perhaps oil. You may have to um, sift through a lot of ground, a lot of earth, in order to find those um, uh, uh, uncut diamonds, gold nuggets, uh, etc. Uh, now with data mining, we're sort of doing the same thing, but not with sort of physical earth, but rather mining through these vast um, data sets. So by doing so, the objective is to detect, discover these um, previously unknown patterns in the data. Now, of course, with patterns, one needs to be a little cautious. The two variables could be correlated. For example, let's say X and Y, such that if they have a so-called positive correlation, then they move in the same direction, such that if X goes up, Y goes up, and if X goes down, Y goes down. Some variables may have a negative correlation. They move in opposite directions. One goes up, the other goes down. But regardless of a positive or negative relationship, um, uh, they are uh, related in some way. But just because we identify perhaps a correlation between two variables does not necessarily mean it is a causal relationship. We're not necessarily saying that changes in X are driving changes in Y. Um, however, 
that um, uh, those sort of causal relationships may be of great interest to us. So data mining is helpful for finding correlations, but I think we still need a human sense check that you know, uh, let's say X and Y are deemed to be related, that one is perhaps actually a driving force of another. Now, when we look at building models in machine learning, we will have lots of possible models that we could construct to solve one specific problem. And whenever one faces a choice in life, in any um, uh, domain, uh, when you can choose among things, which thing would you choose? Uh, I think the rational uh, choice would be to choose the best thing. But if you want the best of something, uh, one needs to clarify or qualify in what sense is something the best. Um, uh, you take COVID vaccines, for example. There are many vaccines available. Okay, in some countries, uh, maybe it's not uh, the full um, uh, range of vaccines easily available. But um, in the UK, for example, um, a few different uh, COVID vaccines um, have been available for people to get vaccinated. Now, if you had a free choice about which uh, COVID vaccine to have, uh, you would want presumably the best one. But I think best in that sense is probably going to relate to how effective the vaccine is at um, perhaps not preventing you from catching COVID, but perhaps minimizing the um, effects if you were to contract COVID. So that word minimize is an example of optimization. So when you want the best of something, we want to choose the optimal um, thing from the range of things available. Now, when we optimize, of course, that could be minimizing something. Um, it could be uh, maximizing at something. So um, in the uh, COVID vaccine case, we want to maximize the effectiveness of the vaccine and choose the one which is most um, effective. In matters of prediction in a machine learning uh, context, um, uh, we may wish to perhaps develop some loss function. So uh, you know, while the future hasn't happened yet, we could undertake some back testing of our predictive model on the past. Namely, um, if we were to have gone back in time, use this machine model that we've developed, how good was it or would it have been at predicting what subsequently occurred? And if we can judge the predictive performance of a, a model historically, uh, while that doesn't guarantee it will have the same um, predictive performance going forward, uh, faced with the uncertainties that we inevitably face, it would seem, I think, uh, sensible and rational to choose from among many different machine learning models, the one which is optimal in the sense that it minimizes some sort of prediction uh, error. Uh, statistics uh, also linked uh, here. Um, if we wish to incorporate uh, probability into our models, such that we may assume uh, so-called input variables to a machine learning model follow a particular probability distribution. And I'm fairly confident that many of you tuning in today will at least be familiar with the normal distribution, that sort of familiar bell curve. Uh, a very popular uh, sort of default choice of probability distribution for um, many so-called random variables. But we could also have more uh, algorithmic uh, based uh, models. So just to perhaps uh, make you aware of some common terms used in the machine learning sphere. Of course, this is all being delivered uh, in English. I'm sure there are um, Kazakh equivalents, but my uh, Kazakh is uh, very, very rusty <laughs> from uh, my visits there. Uh, so we do sort of uh, divide up our uh, machine learning uh, models into the supervised and unsupervised learning types. And uh, which is which? Well, it's dependent on whether there is a so-called dependent or response variable namely something that we're trying to explain. Well, clearly, I think we need some examples. If this was in, let's say, a, um, a company, maybe we're trying to explain sales or customer satisfaction or brand awareness or market share. And inevitably, these things will fluctuate over time. There will be variation in sales, uh, customer satisfaction, brand awareness, market share. Can we explain that variation? What is the cause, or more likely, what are the causes 
of that variation. Sometimes um, a dependent variable is not um, known to us, and this would bring us to so-called unsupervised learning techniques, of which uh, two main classes would be that of clustering, looking for similar individuals. So let's say customers. Um, for a large organization, they may have many customers, and while every customer is unique, inevitably some customers will exhibit similar tastes and preferences, such that we may wish to segment the market into so-called clusters, uh, or equivalently segments, looking for um, homogenous or similar kinds of uh, customers who may respond in a similar way to a, a, a new particular product or some uh, promotion or marketing uh, messaging. We also have something called a factor analysis or principal components analysis, PCA, if we are looking for similar variables. Again, some examples to come. And just on the uh, supervised learning route, uh, regressions. So if we wanted to explain that variation in sales, for example, regression would be um, uh, our choice of modeling technique. Uh, classification is if we are trying to predict a categorical variable. So let's say your company has a website um, and you're selling your um, goods or services through a website. Uh, a prospective customer lands on a product page. Then of interest to us is will that a particular customer ultimately buy the product or not? So will there be a sale? Let's call that um, a positive outcome. We could code it as one, or do they um, uh, not proceed to their um, uh, to the uh, checkout area? And so there's no sale. Perhaps we'll code that as a zero. So depending on the type of dependent variable, uh, regression um, or classification, and if there's a, not a clearly def uh, defined dependent variable, we would um, consider either clustering or factor analysis. So just uh, bring in some visuals now, I, I like visualizations, uh, although this was not done using a Tableau, uh, but rather uh, an example to show um, note the arrows, uh, the relationships, the connections between variables. So just to take perhaps a more sort of business analytics style example. So on the right hand side is a set of uh, possible dependent variables. Now, this is not a collectively exhaustive list by any means. However, I have uh, broken them down into the so-called behavioral responses. So things like the uh, customer awareness, uh, brand perception, et cetera. And also the um, performance metrics like sales revenues, uh, profits, market share, say. Now those performance metrics are more objective. I mean, one can look at the um, you know, financial statements released by companies such that you know what their sales revenues had been, what their profits had been, assuming there was no uh, fraud in the production of those uh, financial statements. However, those behavioral responses, these can sometimes be harder to quantify. How do you really um, quantify the extent of uh, consumer uh, awareness? So for that, we may wish to undertake some sort of market research surveys on a sample of customers and then try and extrapolate from that um, and infer about the wider population of our customers. So uh, there will be inevitably over time variations in brand perception, et cetera. And let's say we're trying to understand that. So to understand a dependent variable, we will need one or likely more than one independent variables, the so-called causes. So if one looks at the direction of these arrows, you know, from left to right, sorry, uh, from uh, yeah, left to right, we are uh, trying to infer causality such that um, under the firm's control would be our so-called uh, marketing mix variable, so product, price, placement, promotion. Indeed, I think yesterday, I was, um, uh, uh, I recall in the news, uh, Unilever, a massive company, announced that it was putting its prices up, I think on average by 11%. So um, the pricing decision of Unilever's products is under Unilever's control. It can decide what it's gonna sell its products for. Now, presumably, um, you know, customers don't like to pay high prices for things. So why on earth would a company, Unilever or any other, decide to increase its prices? Well, that's going to be in response to V 
various situational factors. So if we consider um, supply chain problems, there's a lot of supply chain disruption worldwide um, currently and likely to last for you know, the coming weeks, months, possibly even you know, the next two to three years, maybe. And uh, this has been driving inflation in many parts of the world. And in response to the increase in production costs um, of uh, firms, uh, inevitably they're gonna have to pass on some of this to customers. And so due to uncontrollable factors like um, uh, supply chain uh, disruption, uh, also uh, competition from uh, competitors, these may be driving uh, a firm's decisions with regards to things like price. But rather than you know, say, I'm going to increase my prices due to my um, supply chain issues, why 11%? Why that specific percentage and not something else? So um, presumably Unilever consider this to be the optimal um, decision, uh, taking into account uh, your customer reactions to this, but also their um, uh, profit margins, uh, etc. So uh, what we would like to do is to actually quantify the sensitivity of any one of these variables with uh, any other. And tools such as things like regression can assist us uh, in that. So just uh, a few um, you know, uh, practical examples of uh, machine learning, drawing upon both sort of supervised learning and unsupervised learning techniques, uh, regression, uh, classification, clustering, and uh, factor analysis. So I like this uh, first example. You will all have email accounts. You possibly have multiple email accounts, perhaps a university one and perhaps a personal one at least. And it's common that uh, university, or sorry, um, uh, email accounts, your inbox will have a junk folder for spam. Now, um, you know, uh, I think different people vary in terms of how often they check their spam folder. And if you have not checked your spam folder recently, uh, after this session, I'll give you a little uh, take home exercise is actually to do check your spam folder and look at all of the emails which are in there, such that if an email is in your spam or junk folder, it's because um, the spam detector has judged or classified that incoming email as being not a genuine email for your attention, but rather some uh, spam and has been classified as such, which is why it will be in your spam folder. Now, I'll um, speak for my own personal experience. Uh, I actually fairly regularly check my spam folder um, uh, to see basically how accurate the spam detector is. And most of the time, uh, messages in my uh, junk folder are genuine spam, but not always. So there are some messages which get misclassified. Just as in my main inbox, which clearly I would be looking at very regularly, uh, most of the time, the, in, uh, the emails which make it through the spam detector are genuine, but occasionally some of them are spam, but the detector failed to classify it accordingly. Just to give you a sense about how we could uh, design an automatic spam detector. So uh, if you think back to uh, spam emails that you've received, or often, uh, maybe it's um, you've been notified that um, someone has recently died and they are a long lost relative of yours that you've never heard of, and they've uh, left you millions of dollars. And all you need to do is give all of your personal details, including bank details, in response to this email, and they'll deduct uh, your 2% fee or something, and then you get all of those um, uh, millions of dollars of uh, inheritance. Um, um, so uh, in these emails, often there are many grammatical uh, and spelling errors, deliberately so, such that only the most gullible people will respond to them. Uh, but things like you know, those exclamation marks or the word free. Um, if you have an email with many instances of free, lots of exclamation marks included, uh, that, that's usually a signal that this is not a genuine email. So um, among genuine sort of spam emails, there would be a much higher uh, proportion of uh, words um, or characters which include the words like free or the character of the exclamation mark. And so an incoming email with a very high proportion of free and exclamation marks would be classified as spam. Of course, occasionally, maybe, um, 
it's a, 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 an email with a marketing theme and you're discussing possible promotions about giving a free product, uh, maybe the sort of poster campaign um, or digital marketing campaign you're going to use for this. And maybe uh, there will be exclamation marks in that to um, bring readers' attention to the fact that something is for free. So it's, of course, possible that there could be a genuine email with free and exclamation marks included in it. But on a sort of probability uh, basis, um, most of the time, uh, such um, uh, contents would indicate spam rather than genuine email. So this would be a problem of classification. Uh, if someone sends you an email, uh, then it's to classify it as either genuine or spam, so the sort of binary um, coding based on some predictor variables, namely the contents, the words and characters of the email. Let's take another one uh, from uh, healthcare. Uh, look at, uh, let's consider cancer, for example. Now, there are many different kinds of cancer, and I don't profess to be a medical expert by any means. But let's suppose we were trying to identify risk factors for prostate cancer. Okay. So, um, are there various um, predictor variables such that knowledge of those could help us assess? the risk of a particular individual uh, going on to develop prostate cancer or indeed any other kind of uh, cancer. So uh, what kinds of predictor variables might we consider? These could be uh, demographic, so things like uh, based on um, an individual's age, for example. Indeed, you know, COVID, um, you know, if someone was to catch the, the COVID virus, how serious would it be for that individual? Well, it seems age is one, not the only one, but a major factor. Namely, older people, um, other things equal, tend to, um, um, let's say people above, let's say 80 years old, tend to um, uh, suffer far more seriously when uh, um, uh, infected with COVID than people who are much younger. Uh, clearly, there will be other uh, demographic variables as well, clinical variables as well. Um, so your underlying health conditions, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So um, if you just look at the sort of scatter plots being presented here, namely uh, in the top row, so this thing is our sort of a dependent variable of interest, our uh, response variable, such that do any of these other variables, uh, it's coded on that leading diagonal, do they seem to be related to that response variable? So if we look at that top row, just by I, do you see any relationships? So if I take uh, this one, for example, there seems to be a fairly strong positive relationship, a fairly strong positive correlation between this pair of variables, suggesting that maybe this uh, l carbol uh, can act as a predictor variable. Um, uh, age, okay? so um, as one gets older, does that seem to be a risk factor? So are you more likely to contract uh, prostate cancer if you are older rather than younger? Now, by no means is that a perfect linear relationship. Um, just uh, by eye, you may perhaps judge that there is a, um, uh, an approximate uh, relationship, uh, an imperfect relationship, but a relationship nonetheless between age and um, uh, the risk of um, developing prostate cancer. Sometimes those predictor variables may be uh, categorical. So uh, this SVI coded one, let's say is a binary variable, an individual either does or does not have that particular attribute. And we see the points here tend to be a little bit lower on average than the points here, such that um, an individual with this attribute is perhaps at a greater risk than an individual uh, without. Now, of course, we could just look at um, each predictor variable individually. In practice, we'd like to take a more holistic um, view and consider things like you know, the weight, uh, the age, the blood pressure, so a range of, sort of clinical demographic variables collectively. And based on that combination of values for those predictors, can we then uh, come up with sort of a risk assessment for an individual to develop um, prostate cancer? So supervised learning via regression, uh, it's another classification one. Um, uh, in the UK at least, most physical mail, the mail through a letterbox in your, your front door, 
most of the time now, this tends to be more automated mail, as in it's um, uh, like, a, 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 like a bank statement or credit card statement. It's been printed by a machine, and so the address is actually uh, printed. Occasionally, though, things like birthday cards might be sent to, to friends or relatives, in which case the address on the envelope would be handwritten. So let's say we wanted to uh, create a system such that from uh, the handwritten zip code or postcode on the envelope, can we sort of get the, the, the computer to automatically read the um, zip code and, of course, the, uh, the whole address itself? So uh, for printed uh, numbers and letters, really, um, it's unambiguous what those um, um, numbers and letters are. But people's handwriting styles vary dramatically. You know, uh, take the number two or the number four. Uh, how do you write your twos and fours? Do you have a sort of curly bit here? Do you do your four in that sort of orientation or do you do it something like this? Um, and take this five here. Um, if there'd been sort of less white space here, possibility that this might be misclassified as a six, or might this be misclassified as perhaps a six or an eight? So um, are there um, sort of similarities in construction of uh, digits uh, from which the correct prediction about or classification about the intended number is? And so the, in the, at the sorting office, the letter can be allocated to the right batch for subsequent uh, delivery. And just one more, let's say looking at uh, DNA uh, expressions. Note the use of color in visualizations. Very good for storytelling, uh, unless you are uh, red, green, colorblind, apologies if you are, uh, but the use of color to indicate differences and the intensity of shading um, uh, to indicate differences in order of magnitude is a very a powerful visualization device. So just uh, uh, very uh, quickly at a given time, uh, are there similarities um, if we look at things both column wise, but also row wise, such that there's not a clearly defined dependent variable, but just looking for similarities. So can we cluster um, or look for similar you know, be it columns or rows in order to identify um, uh, genes or DNA samples, which are sufficiently similar indicating sufficiently similar individuals who then may face similar um, uh, risks for particular um, uh, developing particular illnesses or diseases later on. So just briefly on potential, uh, we are forward looking, we do care about the future. It hasn't happened yet, so ultimately we're gonna have to uh, predict or forecast uh, the future. Uh, just a few more examples. Um, perhaps we're trying to anticipate which machines or maybe a car is susceptible to break it down. Now, rather than wait for, let's say, an engine failure of a car, which could be very costly to uh, repair, uh, perhaps better to predict um, which cars are at greater risk of the engine failing and then undertake service and maintenance in advance in a preemptive way at much lower cost um, to prevent the really bad outcome ultimately occurring. Um, the risks of heart attack. Now, this could be from an insurance perspective, people at greater risk of um, a heart attack or any other condition, uh, presumably would have to pay a greater insurance premium, reflecting the greater risk that the insurer faces. This could also be looked at from a clinical perspective, namely um, a greater risk of uh, heart attack, maybe there's some preemptive treatment, uh, some you know, pills or drugs that could be uh, taken to reduce the risk of the heart attack subsequently occurring. The classic uh, finance examples of lending, uh, to, to lend or not to lend. So a, bor a prospective borrower goes to the bank, wants a mortgage or a credit card or whatever, uh, secured or unsecured lending, and the bank would have to make a decision whether to uh, give the loan or not. So um, on what basis could that decision be made? Well, um, how uh, credit worthy is that prospective borrower? They look at income, uh, expenditure history, job security, uh, financial dependence, et cetera, et cetera. And my final one, a favorite of mine, is um, uh, um, uh, based on a film called Minority Report. 
Now, if you've not seen it, um, perhaps over the weekend, see if you can um, uh, 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 view it online um, uh, the film. It was from 2002, it featured uh, Tom Cruise and other um, A-star uh, celebrities. And it was science fiction in 2002. It's still science fiction in 2022. Perhaps it will be science fact in 2042. Who knows? It's a forward looking uh, statement and maybe there's uncertainty. But it was about trying to uh, predict crime. And so um, uh, there was this so-called pre-crime unit trying to predict, let's say a murder. Uh, they predicted a murder was going to take place and then the police intervene in a preemptive way to prevent the murder from ever taking place. Now, this sounds good um, for that prospective murder victim, but uh, we can't predict things perfectly. And uh, there could be misclassifications, um, uh, thinking someone was going to get murdered when they weren't. And so someone is pre, oh, sorry, is arrested before committing the crime, but they never uh, intended to commit the crime at all. So if you just want a sense about your know, predictions and what can happen if predictions go wrong, uh, I would advise watching uh, the film Minority Report, or at the very least watch the trailer. Okay, I'm oh, sorry, almost done on this masterclass bit. Uh, probability, uh, you know, whenever we're dealing with uncertainty, we have to quantify it in probabilistic terms. So sort of probability 101 is that probability is a number between zero and one, indicating how likely some event is to occur. So going back to that uh, email spam filter, if you have lots of the uh, words free and a lot of exclamation mark characters in the email, then with high probability, uh, high probability, uh, we would think it would be spam and would be classified as such. Uh, but if that probability is not one, it's not a certain event. And so there can be these misclassification errors Clearly, we would like to minimize the prevalence of these. So uh, please remember, uh, keep calm, analyze your data. And while this does not guarantee success, um, uh, it does, I think, allow us to, in the long run, make better decisions if these are data-driven decisions. I know I get carried away and I was well overrun on timing, but I will um, uh, head now into a quick briefing on the uh, graduate diplomas. Apologies if you're hearing some fire alarm, there's no fire in this room, uh, but let me uh, share the screen again. Uh, let's go on to uh, that one. So uh, there is the uh, London uh, skyline. Um, if you've not been to London, please do come, uh, spend, your, um, uh, spend your currency and boost the uh, UK uh, economy. Um, so that is uh, Central London, uh, University of London and LSE, clearly located uh, in uh, London. So uh, again, who am I? Uh, Dr. James Abdi. So um, I wear various hats, one of which is as Associate uh, Academic Director of our uh, international programs uh, offered via the University of uh, London. And if you ever read any of our prospectuses, presumably in digital form, you may hear or see the um, acronym EMFSS, which stands for Economics management, finance, and social sciences. Uh, it's just really a collective term for these sort of disciplines that we teach um, at the LSE. So just very briefly, just to uh, relate, um, uh, correlate uh, the University of London and the LSE. So the University of London is one of the oldest universities in the UK, uh, goes back to 1836. I think it's just Oxford and Cambridge, which are older, universities, albeit by several centuries. Uh, the LSA is uh, newer than you are well. Uh, we were born in 1895 and our founding fathers, there were two, and founding mother, there was one, uh, wished to set up a London School of Economics with the aim of understanding the causes of things. And so the rationale for the creation of the, uh, the LSA uh, way back in 1895, and is still our rationale uh, today in 2022, is to understand the world around us uh, from a social science perspective. And by social science, we're really uh, interested in people, looking at the behavior and the decision-making of people. 
So clearly from a machine learning perspective, uh, this could be from uh, people with regards to healthcare. It could be in the retail and e-commerce sector, looking at you know, customers or prospective customers and understanding their needs, wants, and of course, responding to those needs and wants through our product offerings, uh, pricing, promotion, et cetera. Now, um, since uh, LSE's founding, you know, uh, how are we perceived on the world stage? Well, uh, one could look at ranking tables, of which there are many for uh, universities. Um, one should always, I think, uh, view ranking league, uh, or league tables with a, a degree of um, caution, because uh, league tables will vary by the methodology employed. And if you tweak the methodology, how much weighting do you put on specific factors like um, your employment prospects, uh, campus facilities, um, uh, 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 percentage of uh, faculty with PhDs, uh, etc. You change the weighting slightly, you will get slightly different rankings accordingly. Nonetheless, I think rankings give you a rough sense of um, standing of institutions. So in the latest uh, QS uh, rankings, which looks at the social sciences and hence the most, uh, or arguably the most suitable league table um, to judge LSE, given that's what we focus on, uh, ranks number three in the world, which I think is, is pretty good at going. Uh, we are a research-led teaching institution. So our um, uh, uh, academics will be teaching students stuff, yes, but also undertaking research in our respective fields to have a better understanding of the world around us. And as that understanding uh, improves or expands, um, uh, incrementally uh, year on year, that feeds into our curricula and teaching both on campus at the LSE and by extension through our uh, University of London international programs. Uh, Nobel laureates and also world leaders, so heads of state and government, numerous ones have passed through both the LSE and the University of London over the years as either students uh, and or as a faculty. Um, indeed, you could be a Nobel laureate um, of uh, the future. Um, with regards to our international programs, KBTU is one of just over 30 um, accredited and hence officially recognized teaching centers uh, globally. Um, and through the University of London uh, programs, we issue about 50,000 degrees um, annually. So uh, the official um, uh, um, term for the University of London is that of a federation. So University of London uh, operates a federal structure such that all of the uh, logos of which you will perhaps recognize many, like the LSE, UCL, King's College, etc. We are all uh, so-called member institutions, but independent member institutions of the University of London. So think of the University of London as this sort of umbrella uh, organization for which all of those 17 uh, independent member institutions are at member colleges. So LSE is sort of part of the University of London. So uh, now let's bring in KBTU. So really this is a relationship between three uh, institutions. Uh, so with regards to the graduate diplomas, um, a bit more on that uh, in a moment, um, how are these run? Well, touching on these uh, left to right, uh, first of all, the LSE. We provide what's called the academic direction, such that as a research and teaching institution, the um, latest research outputs feed into uh, the uh, curricula, uh, the syllabi that we design, both for our internal uh, programs at both undergraduate and postgraduate level, but also through uh, the programs offered by University of London such that everything that you would learn in your uh, lectures, seminars, classes, uh, that content would have been designed, developed, curated by LSE academics. So um, there are about 50, five zero of us, myself included, uh, across the, uh, the LSE who actively are involved in the uh, development of um, uh, University of London um, uh, modules. So we design the materials. We also design the examinations. Now, actually, for several of the graduate diploma courses, uh, there's actually a diversified um, assessment structure 
such that it is a combination of coursework undertaking some practical project, um, such as uh, writing um, uh, an algorithm or creating uh, a dashboard of visualizations or writing um, market um, uh, research proposals. Um, uh, that has uh, some weighting in the overall assessment to give you some um, experience uh, or, or sort of developing some important communication and sort of uh, trans uh, personal and transferable skills. Uh, as well as a sort of a written uh, examination. So that's the academic direction element. KBTU, one of our global network of teaching uh, centers and uh, KBTU as the teaching center, who's in the name, actually delivers the tuition, the, the teaching. So offers the campus environment. Indeed, I've visited Almaty on numerous occasions, a lovely uh, building, a very historic building in Almaty that you have for uh, KBTU, uh, great uh, quality uh, faculty undertaking the, the teaching. And of course, university study should not be exclusively an independent um, um, or lonely experience. One should, of course, tap into the excellent resource, which is that of your peer network. So your fellow students on a particular program of study is uh, a, it's a great resource to use, to discuss, um, lecture, seminar, class content. Last but by no means least is the University of London. Uh, this is the awarding body. So the ultimate certificate, so uh, for degrees and graduate diplomas, uh, these certificates are issued by the University of London, which of course is a UK institution. And so it is a, a UK uh, qualification that you would um, receive. And of course, that would be internationally uh, recognized. Uh, and I'm biased, but I like to think, right, that the UK is a world leader in higher education. Indeed, our higher education sector uh, in the UK is one of our leading export industries. Perhaps curious to think of education as an export. One usually thinks of you know, physical goods like televisions, cars, phones that may be shipped around the world as uh, exports. Whereas education, not really tangible, it's perhaps more of, a, more of a service, but nonetheless, it is an export industry. So in short, having a UK qualification, clearly one from the University of London in uh, particular, will be uh, internationally recognized. And so if you do aspire to uh, an international uh, career, I think having a UK qualification is um, a definite a plus um, for pursuing that. So just briefly, where are, um, our teaching centres, well, those little dots, uh, all are, um, have been uh, registered teaching centres around the world. A large concentration in Asia, uh, because historically, um, our teaching centres tended to be from uh, Commonwealth countries. That has diversified a bit uh, over the years. You can see we have presence in Kazakhstan, uh, in South America, uh, Egypt, uh, Tunisia, indeed one of our newest teaching centres. Uh, nonetheless, this is quite a small number of teaching centres, given the size of the world, and, and every teaching centre has been um, uh, officially approved by both University of London and the LSE. Um, um, so there's this quality assurance mechanism in place to um, ensure that we are confident that students at any of those uh, teaching centres would receive um, uh, a very... Uh, um, uh, um, rewarding uh, educational experience. Uh, so broadly, our degree um, and graduate diploma subject areas, such that each individual module on a particular program falls into one of these subject areas. And clearly, you know, data science and business analytics are falling heavily into the data science camp, albeit on the business analytics front, uh, of course, some links to business and management as well. So. Just to briefly uh, mention our graduate diplomas, firstly in business analytics. Uh, of course, you can read um, online the um, uh, program details in much greater depth. I don't wish to bore you too much now, uh, but basically the graduate diploma is formed of four modules, of which for business analytics, two are compulsory. Uh, business analytics, applied modeling and prediction, that focuses on things like spreadsheet modeling, so heavy use of Excel, 
also data visualization, so things like uh, Tableau, the creation of um, uh, stories through data visualizations, and that's a very powerful um, uh, device, very powerful skill. Also, uh, statistical methods for market research. So earlier, I referenced uh, like brand uh, awareness, customer perception, customer satisfaction. How do you judge these things? How do you measure these things? Often that would be via uh, uh, surveys and that uh, statistical um, methods for market research course um, has a strong um, emphasis on that. So collectively those two, if you think back to that sort of ideal data scientist uh, is drawing upon the communication visualization elements it's drawing on the sort of domain um, uh, knowledge and skills, um, knowing the knowing the business, the commercial acumen angle, and also some grounding in mathematics and statistics uh, as well, but less really on the uh, programming and sort of database management. You then have a choice of two courses. Uh, these can be drawn from different subject areas, uh, basically management, which is M, and mathematics and statistics, which is N. So uh, management and mathematics both begin with M. Management got the M letter. And so N was assigned to mathematics and statistics. Note on assessment, uh, those two compulsory units do have 30% coursework. So practical tasks, um, which I think are very helpful for developing your writing skills, your creation of dashboards, how you communicate results. Uh, and then the remaining 70% is examination based. Uh, graduate diploma in data science, focusing now more on the sort of programming um, uh, skills and database management from that uh, ideal data scientist graphic earlier, and also heavily on the mathematics and statistics um, um, uh, element. So uh, a couple of compulsory units, one of which machine learning. So things like those regression techniques, those classification techniques, um, the supervised learning, also the unsupervised learning, so clustering, uh, factor analysis, you will see how to do that in both Python and R in that uh, ST3189 uh, module. Then you have some choice. Uh, note you could do things like the ST2187 um, and the 3188, one or other or both of those as elective courses if you wanted to um, consider some of the more business analytics themed uh, courses, but also more theoretical ones in um, sort of, um, uh, mathematics, econometrics as well. So um, how are these assessed? It doesn't um, uh, vary uh, by module, but combinations of coursework and examination. Almost done, then happy to take any questions. Uh, grading scale. So our graduate diplomas, um, every individual module so of the four courses you would take, you would get a numeric mark, so a percentage between zero and 100. Uh, in the UK system, 70 is sort of our minimum uh, mark for what we would deem to be excellent. So our um, graduate diplomas themselves, um, if you successfully completed it, uh, the diploma would be awarded with a classification. And this borrows from the master's classification system in the UK of uh, distinction, merit, and pass. And so um, if you look at the bullet points, you can see there's actually more than one way to achieve a distinction, two ways, <laughs> um, uh, more than one way, like three ways to achieve a, a merit, and then um, other uh, passing graduate diplomas not fulfilling any of those bullet point conditions would achieve um, a, a pass. So um, broadly speaking, we're really looking at sort of your average performance across those four modules. Um, so uh, it's not a, an exact uh, average which is being calculated, it's the number of uh, modules above you know, 40, 50, 60, 70 as specified, but really it's sort of reflecting your average performance across the board. If you do well in all of your four courses, that's likely to be leading to distinction. If you do reasonably well in all four courses, that's likely to be leading to a, a merit. So uh, entry requirements uh, for graduate diplomas. Typically, a student has a degree in a subject area, uh, pretty much any subject area. Uh, but we're looking at perhaps attracting uh, prospective uh, students who are looking to uh, reskill or upskill 
in a slightly different area, such as data science or business analytics. Uh, in terms of quantitative modules, um, especially if you're looking to do the data science graduate diploma, given it is more technical, then there would be an expectation that your um, first degree um, had at least some quantitative modules. Now, clearly, you know, um, prospective graduate diploma students are coming from many different backgrounds and um, you know, uh, cases or uh, applications would be considered on their individual merits um, and judgments can be taken at UOL admissions discretion on to what extent um, courses you think might qualify as a quantitative module would be deemed as uh, such. Uh, English language requirements and age requirements, I'm sure the age one is not a uh, factor if you're looking at people who already uh, have uh, graduated. Um, then uh, almost done. Uh, the LSE itself, um, it's a great institution. This is our library. Don't worry, I'm not suspended mid-air in the library. It is a, a virtual background. But clearly, we would love to uh, see you on campus at uh, LSE. So are there opportunities to actually come to LSE? Uh, yes, uh, perhaps most relevant for discussion now would be the uh, LSE Summer School uh, happening right now. Indeed, I'm giving my summer school lecture uh, later this afternoon. Um, it is, uh, I believe, the largest uh, summer school program of its kind in Europe uh, and the largest by international student uh, enrollment. So if you wish to spend you know, um, three, six or nine weeks um, in the summer at London pursuing um, uh, a course intensively at LSE, you may wish to consider LSE Summer School. Uh, general course is LSE's study year abroad program, uh, not really relevant for typically one year graduate diploma students. Uh, but the bottom one there, master's study, um, uh, LSE is a bit of an outlier in, in uh, many respects, but one of which is that LSE is primarily a postgraduate university in that we have more master's students on campus taking our uh, internal programs than undergraduate students. And so it may be that after completion of a graduate diploma from the University of London, maybe you aspire to pursue a master's degree at the LSE. Now, while there are no certainties, decisions are made under uncertainty, if you have pursued a University of London um, award, like one of our graduate diplomas, I think it's fair to say not a guaranteed admission, but you would have, let's say, a competitive edge in the um, application cycle. So uh, food for thought, and of course a master's degree does not have to be taken immediately after you complete your initial university studies. Uh, many decide to uh, complete university studies, go into the real world, gain some work experience for a few years, uh, accrue some savings, and then at a time that is right for them, every individual's circumstances are, are different, to perhaps uh, pursue a master's degree in a few years time. That door, I would say, is always open to you. It is competitive entry, but having done the University of London uh, program, indeed, I think it would give you a competitive edge. My final slide, then I'll happily take uh, any questions. Um, a sample, this is a degree certificate rather than a graduate diploma one, uh, but nonetheless, um, you can see uh, the University of London there at the top uh, as the awarding body of the qualification. You will see explicit reference to the London School of Economics and Political Science with regards to matters of assessment, because coursework, uh, examinations, these would have been set uh, and graded by uh, LSE uh, appointed uh, examiners. The teaching centre, so for example, KBTU in this instance, uh, does not feature on the certificates. Uh, that's not to, be, not to be disrespectful to the teaching centre, but the qualification itself um, is determined exclusively by um, the study of our materials and performance in assessments that have been administered by the University of London. So um, the VC, the Vice Chancellor, um, in whichever year you would uh, complete, whoever that may be at that time, their signature would appear. And indeed that is a UK qualification. And if you put that on your CV or your resume, I think that would be a very uh, powerful um, uh, qualification uh, when you are looking either for 
applying for master's programs um, um, uh, overseas, perhaps, or um, uh, looking for uh, jobs, whether in Kazakhstan or again uh, overseas. So um, you know, it's a very competitive world, and you know there are many graduates out there, and you want to do your best to distinguish yourselves from everyone else, um, and therefore. Anything extra you can add to your CV, your resume, such as a graduate diploma, uh, such as you know, uh, attending LSE at summer school. Um, I think these are very, um, va literally um, uh, value adds to a CV or a resume and to put you in very um, uh, good standing. Uh, okay, so uh, those were my sort of various uh, presentations. Um, I see, I think uh, Aidan has raised his virtual hand for a question. Uh, Aidan, hello, hi. Hello, uh, James, thank you very much. Uh, very nice presentation, uh, very useful about uh, data science and uh, machine learning and how actually our programs, uh, graduate diplomas in uh, data science and business analytics fit into that and how we uh, actually attempt to produce uh, up-to-date specialists. Uh, now we move on to the information sessions and I would like just to uh, tell a few words that if you have questions about the teaching center, about our professors and all the inner things, uh, you could address them at five o'clock. I will have a separate session for that. Uh, now, if you have particular questions about LSC, about University of London, about our connection, or about data science and, and how important this field is, about um, business analytics, what this degree will give you, uh, then, of course, you're welcome to ask James. Okay, so now I think we can start with the information session, and thank you very much again. A pleasure. Uh, yes, if anyone has any questions, perhaps the easiest if you'd like to, to pop them uh, into, uh, into the chat, uh, perhaps while we await uh, any uh, inbound questions. I mean, I, I think, yes, you, to basically sell data science and business analytics to you, um, I mean, you, uh, you're all young um, and therefore have many years of work lying ahead of you, lucky you, and uh, you know, the world is forever changing. Um, and you know, of course, it uh, makes sense to prepare for the jobs of uh, the future, not for the jobs of the past. Um, however, even today, I mean, even the present as well as the future, I mean, demand for people with strong uh, quantitative skills, being able uh, either to perhaps take a more programming heavy um, um, uh, focus or on the uh, analyst focus, being able to explain uh, results to senior management saying, uh, these are skills in very short supply today, but in very high demand. And if you think back, to, if you ever did economics, like economics 101, sort of supply and demand, your demand exceeds supply uh, today. Um, and when that happens, typically the price goes up. Now the price in this instance represents salaries that people can uh, command. So there is this um, skills deficit today. And uh, while the future is uncertain, I think with high probability, we can expect that skills deficit to widen in the years ahead. Okay, yes, the supply of uh, people with quantitative skills will increase, but I don't think it will keep pace with the increase in demand from employers, whether in public sector or private sector. And that skills deficit is only going to widen, which of course for you is excellent news because I think there will be no shortage of job opportunities out there. And if you don't believe me, um, why should you believe me? <laughs> perhaps um, if you are perhaps on LinkedIn, uh, for example, or uh, just uh, go on to the, the jobs pages there and just do some searches, whether for Kazakhstan, whether for UK or elsewhere, of some keywords like Python, R, data science, uh, visualizations, uh, Excel, Tableau, um, and just see what job opportunities uh, there are. And I think you will be uh, pleasantly surprised, not just by the number of positions, but also the variety of sectors and prospective employers looking to hire in these fields. Um, and I think that's perhaps the best way to really judge you know, a demand uh, for, for any subject uh, area. So it really, I think, does make sense for you to um, uh, prepare for, as I say, the jobs of the future, not the jobs of the past, 
very likely there will be a lot of a lot more job automation in the years and decades ahead um, and, and so some um, some kinds of job roles I think are at much greater risk of automation these tend to be those which are quite repetitive that uh, could easily be automated by a machine um, I think though uh, on the making sense of data the machines aren't going to replace humans in that uh, domain for a very long time if ever unlikely in our working lifetimes at least. So I think there is no um, danger of sort of job automation in the sort of data science business analytics spheres. Um, uh, and maybe you know, the job you may have in perhaps five years time, maybe that job title, that job role doesn't yet exist in that just as jobs are being destroyed or being automated, there are new jobs being created all of the time. And so, um, in, Barely five years from now, there will be jobs which today that job title doesn't yet exist. So uh, quite uh, exciting times. Oh, I, I think uh, we have one or two uh, in the chat. It is an informative session. Thank you. <laughs> Most welcome. Uh, there are minor uh, electives that students should choose. Only some aren't there. Uh, correct. So in those graduate diplomas, uh, in each one, you have two compulsory courses, uh, and then you have two um, electives. Uh, now, these have to be drawn from certain what we call selection groups. These are broadly subject areas. Um, and um, uh, this may perhaps be worth discussing with a local faculty, uh, depending on your particular interests about which specific electives might be most suitable for you. But this, this is deliberate in our programs such that to um, complete successfully a program of study in a specific subject area, inevitably there are some courses which will have to be compulsory in that subject area. But we don't wish to be too sort of dictatorial. We do like students to be able to tailor make um, a program of study to satisfy their own academic interests, also professional interests as well. And this is why deliberately we do allow some look not completely, but some uh, electives. Um, so depending on which skills you would like to further develop, you have the opportunities to do so. Please, any other questions? Don't be shy. You can ask or, or you Hello. can write in the chat. Yes, please. Hello, Hi. Mr. James. Yeah, thank you for detailed presentation. Uh, I have a question. Uh, are there any uh, like interim exams or tests to check the understanding of the materials? Because for myself, I don't have quantitative skills or background, and it's important uh, to get feedback from lectures before final exa exam. Um, uh, excellent question. So this is where KBTU as a teaching center re really steps in. So um, uh, sort of interim tests, uh, mock exams, uh, these are what would be administered by KBTU as a teaching center uh, by your local uh, faculty uh, to indeed give you feedback on your performance. Note, such tests will not count from the University of London end. It is purely uh, coursework components for modules which have them and the final examinations, which tend to be in May or June, uh, those um, uh, ultimately determine your University of London marks, but indeed this is uh, a critical role of the teaching centre, as in alongside the teaching would be periodic tests. Uh, the number of such tests and the frequency of them that is at the discretion of the teaching centre um, and the faculty in charge of individual modules, but absolutely uh, that support is there to prepare students for um, for the uh, final uh, examinations. Thank you. Okay, I, I'm, I'm, I'm making a prediction here that probably the, the last uh, uh, question, um, in which case I'll perhaps uh, draw, draw proceedings to a close here. As I Dan mentioned, I think at 5 p.m. your time, 40 minutes, I think, uh, uh, sort of KBTU style uh, information session. 
focus more on uh, what support KBTU can provide. But you know, I have firsthand experience of uh, visiting uh, KBTU, um, uh, clearly not recently given COVID, but hopefully uh, a return visit to Almaty in the not too distant uh, future. Uh, but I know it's a very supportive environment there, excellent faculty, really good um, experience. It does get very cold in winter, <laughs> very hot uh, in summer, but uh, I think those extremes of temperature are uh, just a visit at least quite, um, quite enjoyable. The food in Kazakhstan, of course, amazing. Um, so, uh, well, I'd like to thank you all for your time. I say this has been recorded and I think we'll have a chance to you know, listen again, uh, should you so choose. Uh, but thank you very much for taking uh, the time out to, to listen to me. I hope this gave you some uh, food for thought. And uh, while there are no certainties in life, death and taxes are allegedly the only two, everything else is uncertain. Um, faced with uncertainty, the best we can do is to maximize our chances of success. And I would say, if you decide to pursue one of our graduate diplomas, whether in data science or business analytics, I can't promise you success, no one can, but um, I can, um, I think, legitimately claim you are uh, maximizing your chances of success, whatever success looks like to you. Is it the salary? Is it just the, the job role that you, your dream job role, um, regardless of salary? Is it a master's degree you seek to do, or PhD uh, beyond that? Um, I think this will really uh, maximize uh, your chance of success. So uh, thank you one and all, uh, please do take care, stay safe, stay healthy. And uh, if you do enroll, and I do manage to make it uh, out to uh, Almaty, uh, it'd be lovely to uh, meet you uh, in person. So uh, thank you all and take care. And don't forget Aidan's uh, session at uh, 5 uh, p.m. Thank you so much for taking your time and participating. We also hope we can meet uh, in person very soon. Thank you, have a nice day. Thank, Thank you, you Andrew. for joining in. Thank you. Thank Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.